the velocity talent here is just unbelievable. And I think that that would push him over whatever the dollar figure Yamamoto has had, as, as you mentioned right there. So yeah, he's, he's worth more than Yamamoto in my opinion. You've been looking in depth at Roki Sasaki. We're getting a ton of questions from fans about him. Of course, asking if he is going to sign and be able to break loose from NPB this year. But can you tell me what he would bring to the table? Yeah, super electric arm. This dude is like kind of unbelievable. I think the central question, if you're a front office trying to figure out whether you actually want to add him to your roster for the coming season, is what happened from 23 to 24 in terms of his fastball shape and velocity dip. He was a guy that in 2023, as you see on the screen right now, he averaged like 99, sitting 99, which is just insane. And then he fell to 97. And now there's a lot of rumors around like, oh, he was just preserving his arm, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't think I totally buy that without some biomechanical analysis that, that actually allows me to see that he's still moving as efficiently. And I just don't think we're obviously going to get that given that data is not really available. So if you're front office, you got to figure out exactly what happened to him from a movement pattern standpoint between 23 and 24 and whether you can get him back to 23. And I'm not even necessarily saying that from the pure velocity side. I think he could survive if he was more 97, 98. But the decline in his shape on that board you guys, you guys just showed is, is the biggest thing. The pitch became a little more two-plane despite the fact that he was throwing from a very similar arm slot. So in my opinion, that means he's kind of hiking his arm and cutting the ball a little more. I want him not hiking his arm and not cutting the ball. I want him carrying that thing as much as possible because one of his superpowers, so to speak, on the pitching side is the ability to throw really hard and create a ton of total movement on his fastball. And uh, that's the big thing from an evaluation standpoint. I'm pretty confident front offices are digging into as to whether they want to sign him. Now, the other angle here is that if he's subject to the international restrictions, that he can kind of pick wherever he wants to go. So maybe this becomes the teams pitching to him as to what they can do for him. And uh, I'm pretty fascinated to see kind of what the net result here is with Suzaki. One thing that you showed when we showed those numbers is his release gained nine inches. Okay. Now, the velo might be down, but his extension, the nine inches of extension, that almost makes up for the velo as a hitter. Like, if I look out there, 99, he's releasing it farther away, and then I'm, I'm facing a guy throwing a little bit slower, but with a release closer to me, doesn't that make up for some of this other stuff that's missing? Yeah, that's like the perceived velocity angle I think you're talking about, AJ. I do think that has some implication on it, but I, I think overall, I don't have the board here, but if you were to look at the actual performance of the pitch, the swinging strike rate dropped a pretty good amount. There's a lot of little elements of the pitch that really started to regress, primarily because the shape of the pitch, I think is one of the more important things there, that that lost some vertical break, lost some of the arm side movement. It just wasn't as efficient of spin on that pitch that was allowing it to succeed. So the although the extension kicked up, which I do agree from a perceived velocity standpoint might help a bit, the overall variables that I think matter more in that situation are the velo being down and the shape being different. And again, it's a little weird to have a big extension jump and not change release height. If you just think about the angle of like the further down the mound you are, which is sloped, naturally your release is going to drop. If that's not occurring, then to maintain the same release height, despite extending down the mound, releasing from a further point, your arm's going to have to naturally kick up a bit. So that's the main thing that I'm curious about is like, what does the major league front office think about how he was moving differently in 24? Do they like that better? Do they want to get him back to 23? These are the questions I think front offices are asking themselves. You had said right at the end of your first, first evaluation on him, you said, they're not sure if they're going to want to sign him. Everybody wants to sign this guy. Right. I mean, there's yeah, no, there's not, they're totally, not signing totally. him for it's, it's $55 million essentially going for the posting fee. Like that's a drop in the bucket for a guy that gave up two home runs. I get it. Japan doesn't have big power. He gave up two home runs in 111 innings. Like they're, they're going to go after him. So are these, are we delving too much into these numbers in the sense, like we're not giving him $300 million. We're not, we're not, the Yamamoto is not like, Yo, he Yamamoto's taking them out for dinner when they play together with the Dodgers because it's essentially who's gonna who wants to who's gonna sign them. But <laughs> what 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 is the what is the hang up in the sense that like we're delving too far into the numbers? He's had success, and all the guys I talked to that have played there says he's actually better than Yamamoto, just less control. I agree with that. I think he is a better pitcher than Yamamoto, especially if he flashes anything like he flashed in the WBC in 2023. I'm definitely getting past, like, we're getting deep in terms of talking about, like, the small little subtle changes as to, like, how he moved differently, et cetera. But at the end of the day, I 
do think any team is just probably offering their max international pool and is like, do you want to sign with us? And I feel like, again, it just goes back to Sasaki as like, hey, where do you want to sign, man? You can kind of pick wherever you want to go. And I think I'm, I'm talking about all these nuanced things because I do think different organizations have different aptitudes for fixing all these things, right? If you want to remove the whatever percent chance that's very high, he goes to the Dodgers, which I do agree with you, is probably where he ends up. But let's say he doesn't end up there. Let's say he goes to like another random organization, like the Angels, for example, right? They probably need pitching. They can use velocity. They have history of shining Otani, et cetera. Like maybe he goes there. I'm not as confident in the Angels pitching brass to fix these various things that we're talking about. So maybe he underperforms relative to what we're talking about. But again, for the price, yeah, I mean, he's he's going to be like a plus value player. I just, I'm the nerd here. Come on, I'm the guy digging into like the nuance of what's <laughs> happening and, and how he moves and the shapes that are being different and maybe him not being as exceptional as 2023. But the overall package here is incredible. And I'm, I'm definitely knocking him on this fastball thing, but the split here is like one of my favorite splitters. Immediate, it'll be one of the most distinct splitters probably in baseball the second he steps on a major league mound. How, how worried are teams about his innings? His career high is 129. He's never gotten over 130 in his career. And at the big league level, we just talked about Shohei and Yamamoto and how the Dodgers are already going to have to go to a six-man rotation so he would fit in there. But how worried about big league teams about the fact that he's never thrown over 100? Forget like 200 innings. We're talking 130 innings. Last year he threw 91 innings. This year he threw 111 innings. Like there is not a track record of making it, you know, a start and getting to, you know, God forbid, 150 innings even. Yeah, this is a this is a great question because I I'd be curious again from like the the standpoint of an organization looking at him. I'd want to figure out as much as I can about what his off season throwing program looks like and what he's doing in season from like a conditioning and weightlifting standpoint. How much he's using weighted balls, etc. Like this dude throws incredibly hard. Like if he's not conditioning his body properly to be able to hold up sitting ninety nine over the course of like one hundred and fifty plus innings, then like you got to change that. Like that is a, a definite kind of more qualitative variable to, to play around with in terms of how confident you are and maybe pushing him to like 130 next year, et cetera. But, and as, and also too, like the schedule in Japan is obviously different. This is something Shota Imanaga talked about a lot and um, Yamamoto dealt with too, Sanya dealt with too, like the, the different cadence of a season and pitching however often you want to, uh, excuse me, not however often you want to, but how different it is from NPB. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think you got to dig into like what he's doing from a conditioning standpoint to get his arm in the proper spot to throw this card. I'm not trying to bag the Chibolote Marines and stuff like that, but I, I don't know what he did, you know? And we've seen a lot of guys now in baseball in the most recent years, Gary Crochet, Justin Steele, et cetera, a couple guys make large leaps in terms of innings. And I think that's a byproduct of teams having a very good understanding of like what workload you need to put in in the off season in order to be able to hold up throwing incredibly hard over 150 plus innings. This episode is brought to you by Manscaped, the global leader in men's lifestyle and grooming. If you're looking for that fresh barbershop shave at home, introducing Manscaped's newest innovation, the Chairman Pro Electric Foil Shaver. Head over to manscaped.com and join the over 11 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by using code FAL. 20 for 20 percent off plus free shipping i've had so many bad razors in my past and you only get one face make it count with the latest tech in face electric shavers i'm talking flex adjust technology which makes sure the blades and pivoting head adapt to the unique contours of your face and neck to hit all the angles. There's a travel lock so you don't hear buzzing in your bag from an accidental on button situation. And the Chairman Pro also features an LED spotlight to help you see every detail. Get the Chairman Pro today and experience a shave that is smooth as a baby's butt. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code FAL20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code FAL20 at manscaped.com. Lance, how much do you think he's worth if he wasn't restricted by the current system, right? So let's say he's just a free, free agent right now. Does he command a similar deal to Yamamoto's 325 mil and also the $51 million that they had to spend on the posting fee talking about the Dodgers? <laughs> I, I do. I think he's worth more than that, honestly, just because of the underlying velocity and how much how prized that is the major league baseball. Um, I just think he's a, he's a fascinating pitcher. Like, I think there's a lot you could do with him from a development standpoint. He doesn't really spin the ball that well. That's probably the one slight concern you have. You saw Yamamoto towards the middle of the year and into the playoffs start to break out a, a nasty sweeper up around like 2,800 RPM. That thing, I think, is going to be a weapon for him next year as he starts to expand usage of it. But with a guy like Sasaki, like Sasaki was under 2,000 RPMs on his slider in this most recent season. Like, he's definitely more of like a weird fastball, super distinct splitter. I think a smart team would probably just push 
the velocity really, really high on, on a cutter slider pitch against righties to get him something going away. Maybe you flash a big curveball with him. You add a sinker if he's having problems with the forcing to righties. Like, there's definitely some development to do here. Um, and I think that he's just the velocity talent here is just unbelievable. And I think that that would push him over whatever the dollar figure Yamamoto has, had, as, as you mentioned right there. So, yeah, he's, he's worth more than Yamamoto, in my opinion. Okay, Lance, let me ask you this. His arm action scares me a little bit from the tape we've shown. He's a hook. He's got – I can't really show you because of yeah, the – Yeah, that inverted W action. But he's got a bad hook and a bad W. I mean, does that also scare teams away? Because usually guys that have a hook, there's very few people that have a hook that lasts very long because it's, it's really, really tough on not only your elbow, but also the hook is bad on your shoulder because you're, a lot of, you're late a lot of times, and that leads to shoulder problems. Yeah, yeah. What I think you're getting at there is like one of the most basic things in pitching, which is like where how is your arm up at front foot plant when that front foot starts to accept ground reaction force? Like, is your arm up? And he's a little, you could argue, maybe slightly late. But this gets into the whole angle, like what information is actually available on him. I don't believe that most orgs in MLB would be able to get like a Kinetrax report and totally understand some of the biomech variables, you know. Uh, rotation speed of his pelvis and torso and like how he's sending energy through his chain. A lot of this may end up just being more video scouting or perhaps major league orgs have contacts. I'm not exactly sure what systems Chibolote has set up from a Biomex standpoint. Like I'd be fascinated to see if any org could get their hands on like specific data and figure out exactly what they want to do. But that, that shot right there, you just showed like, you could probably just send that to a really good pitching expert and get him to understand, like, maybe there's some things in the lower body they could tweak to get the arm action you're talking about, AJ, a little bit cleaner, so to speak. But maybe, as you're saying, that's related to some of this arm fatigue he had. It seems like he had. There's a quote that um, from the Chibolote, I believe it was translated, so I think maybe some of it is lost in translation. But they basically said that he missed a couple starts because of the poor condition of his right arm. To me, that just kind of sounds like he either had maybe slight dead arm or arm fatigue or something along those lines. But this is all connected in the same way, right? So this is why I don't totally believe that, you know, he was preserving himself for MLB sitting two ticks lower. Like, I think there was something up there in his body or how he was moving or general arm health. The other angle here is that if you're a team projecting him out, like, you're probably building in some major arm surgery at some point in the next five-ish years or whatever. Like, I guess it's a matter of whether that happens sooner rather than later, but... I don't. I think we're past the point of just assuming, you know, this guy's going to give me 170 innings each of the next six years. Like, I think teams build in risk of injury. Like, it's just become so common in these guys, especially when you throw this hard. You know, if you pull, like, 2023 20, fastball velocity leaders and look at how many innings they threw in 24, I think the healthiest one was Hunter Green, and he hit the IL. You had multiple Tommy John surgeries. Like, this is just kind of the state of the game we're in. Like, if you throw hard, you're probably going to end up with some kind of internal brace, TJ, and once every – six years or however long they're projecting this stuff to last. So you're building that in. But again, going back to the monetary side that Scott was talking about, like it, it's such a low dollar value off the bat that it, it it probably doesn't matter at the end of the day. Like maybe we're digging too much into the specifics here. Like wherever he goes, like it, it really comes down to how that team adjusts the various finite things that will make him better. But if this isn't really like a monetary concern, like we're not debating how much he's going to get or how much he's worth. Cause like 30 teams are going to probably offer him whatever's left in their pool and figure it out from there. Hey everybody, be sure to like and subscribe for more content. We're back here every weekday, all year long, so do not miss an episode. The videos are coming in all day. Here's another video you might enjoy. Baseball, the way it should be covered.